Um, this was an interesting study. So what they did was they took uh, human mesenchymal stem cells, they were bone marrow, and they took them, put them in a petri dish, and added TB4 to them to look at what would happen. Okay, and then save your questions for the end just so I can get through all of it, and then we, I'll answer anything you guys want. So our next peptide we're going to talk about is thymosin beta-4. First point of clarification is thymosin beta-4 is not the same as TB500. Okay? When you start looking into these peptides, you'll start seeing TB500, and you'll start thinking it's the same thing. Now, there's two errors that are happening. One is that certain places are calling TB4 TB500, and in that case, as long as they actually have TB4, if they're just improperly calling it TB500, that's fine. I mean, it's not fine because it, it'd be nice to have consistency, but it's not a different peptide. If you have actual TB500, that is a different peptide than TB4, okay? TB4 has 43 amino acids in it, okay? TB500 has seven amino acids. It's a fragment. So basically what's happening right now is, in the peptide world is, yes, we are discovering how to synthesize new peptides and what they're useful for, but then there's research that's going on and saying, okay, of these 43 peptides, which of these amino acids actually bind to the receptor that's the anti-inflammatory portion of this? They find that, they isolate it out, they make a new peptide, and it's a fragment, okay? That's what TB500 is for. TB500 is more anti-inflammatory than TB4, and so they've basically isolated that TB500 out. But, again, I like peptides that have a pleiotropic effects, so I prefer TB4 over TB500 because we're gonna get a lot more different effects. It, it's not gonna be as strong anti-inflammatory as TB500, but you're going to have more widespread effects that I think, personally, uh, end up being better. So TB4 is naturally found in every single human cell in your body. It is upregulated when we have an injury, and so therefore it is found in higher concentration where we have wound healing, okay? Whether that's cutaneous wound or whether that's something like uh, cartilage degeneration or something like that. Here's our pleiotropic effects that we talked about, right? Going to increase angiogenesis, increase cell migration. It is actually going to promote mesenchymal stem cell differentiation, and we'll talk about that in a bit because there's some caveats. It activates uh, progenitor cells to help with uh, native healing and then also decreases cytokines. It's mechanism of action. It's, it is the principal um, uh, actin sequestering protein, which basically means it's gonna bind to actin and it helps to move the cell. Okay, so it is actually responsible for helping to build the extracellular matrix cytoskeleton that we need. And so there's actually a lot of interesting research on TB4 with stem cells because stem cells need a scaffold. They need biophysical forces in order to know what type of cell they need to become, where they might need to migrate to, and TB4 can help with that. Here again is just our, the two branches of TB4 being anti-inflammatory and then promotion of wound healing and then just kind of everything we see uh, with all that. And you guys are all gonna get this afterwards so you don't have to worry about that. Um, this is a slide talking just about how TB4 works. Um, basically what happens is you have this TB4 protein that is going to generate ATP using a hydrogen gradient that is then going to result in an opening of this P2X pore, which is then going to send out signals to result in cell migration. So that's how one of the ways that we're seeing some actual migration of stem cells towards an area because of TB4. So again, if it's one of the first, <clears throat> excuse me, first proteins uh, that's upregulated on an injury, it would kind of make sense that it's sending out signals to the rest of the body to say, hey, send your stem cells to us so we can try to heal this. <clears throat> um, this was an interesting study. So what they did was they took uh, human mesenchymal stem cells, they were bone marrow, 
and they took them, put them in a petri dish, and added TB4 to them to look at what would happen, okay? What they saw was that the TB4 inhibited the osteogenic pathway, the osteogenic differentiation of the stem cells, didn't change the chondrogenic pathway, and actually increased the adipogenic differentiation of MSCs. Now, there are some docs who will then say, oh, I'll never, I won't do any TB4 if there's any form of, of bone lesion or anything like that because of this study that says that TB4 is going to decrease the rate of osteogenic uh, differentiation. However, this is in a Petri dish. So what I take from it, because again, when while some things are consistent where what happens in the Petri dish is actually what happens in the body, a lot of the time it's what happens in the Petri dish is slightly different than what happens in the body, right? And so the takeaway that I have from this is that I may not, under certain circumstances, want to mix my TB4 with my bone marrow and then inject it inside of a joint or inject it intraosseous to try and help heal a bone marrow lesion, okay? That's how I uh, kind of think about it. <clears throat> so here are the, the indications that I would use thymosin beta-4. So any form of healing, I don't generally mix it directly with adipose or bone marrow-derived treatments. Um, and I'm unsure right now if I want to mix it with my uh, adipose microfat and nanofat tissue transfers uh, in the sense of not mixing it directly, but doing the 20, normal 20-day 20 course of TB4 after an adipose treatment. And again, my thought there is, well, if this research study actually does hold some weight in vivo, where if we do TB4 and it actually increases adipogenic differentiation of MSCs, then when we're basically taking adipocytes, pre-adipocytes, and we're moving them to a new location, maybe I don't want that. So I'm still uh, playing around with that one and figuring it out. Here are my, uh, how I dose it, okay? Non-procedure dosing. So if a patient comes to me and they have a nagging injury and they just want to try peptide therapy, we'll do uh, 750 micrograms sub-Q daily. Uh, generally, I'm doing a 20-day course, which is one vial from the compounding pharmacy I get it from. Um, but you can do it upwards of two months. If you're going to use it intraoperative, meaning you're actually mixing it with anything, then we're going to be doing 250 micrograms per five cc's of injectate. And then post-procedure dosing. Um, I used to just do this, just do the 750. However, I've kind of shifted a little bit, and I think I'm seeing better results. But I'm doing a higher dose, so I'm doubling the dose, and I'm only doing it for seven days. So I'm doing 1.5 milligrams for seven days. And again, my thought process is the following. After an injury, you have a huge upregulation in this gene that makes this protein, and then it slowly falls off like this. So I'd rather front load and boom, make this huge curve, and then stop and have levels slowly go down, as opposed to this slow up and then hold and then slow down. So I'm trying to mimic what might happen in the body, and again, Compared to the body, I'm still stupid, so who knows? I could be doing it wrong. <laughs>